Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Moore, and you're, you're very welcome. Um, I want to begin with, with, with the crisis period, beginning in 07. The beginning of 07, a stockbroker in Davies begins advising against uh, the purchase of Anglo shares because he believes them to be overvalued. What was your reaction when you heard that news? I don't recollect, um, Deputy, the uh, precise timing or, or who that stockbroker was. But if you look back um, from 2005, six, the bank's stock had re-rated. So it used to trade at a discount to the market. And in 2007, had risen to a premium to the market. And, and with that change, with that increase in value over time, a number of brokers then, at that stage in 2007 or 2008, but especially in 2007, changed their recommendation from a buy or a strong buy to a, a hold or a sell. Oh, your reaction to stockbrokers who were uh, claiming that the stock was overvalued by two-thirds and were recommending a hold or a sell. Do you remember any particular reaction, yourself or in the bank? In 2007, Deputy, uh, and the stock being overvalued by two-thirds, I, I, I don't have direct recollection have of... You, have you read Simon Carswell's book? Um, no, I have bank. skimmed through it, but okay. I haven't read the book. Well, do you mind if I put a couple of things from that book sure. to you? Certainly. Um, there was a meeting of investors in Anglo's boardroom in September 2007, something you did regularly, yeah, you brought people in. Um, and a stockbroker from Davies was there who had been advising against purchasing Anglo shares because he felt that the falling property market and rising cost of borrowing would be a problem for the bank. And it's alleged, or it's, it's written in the book, that you escorted that person out of the meeting um, and had harsh words with them. Do you recollect that? I do recollect the instance of the meeting. And uh, if I stand back looking at the, at the time, uh, Davies were stockbroker to the bank, mm -hmm. and um, that means their analysts covered the bank. All of their other stockbrokers were allowed to take their view in respect of the bank, um, and they could express their own view if they if they wanted or as they saw fit. Were you a shareholder in the bank? Yes. Okay. Do you think that that your position as a shareholder? Could clouded your judgment in some way when it came to these types of issues? I don't think so at all. You don't think so? Okay. So you don't accept the finding of the Nyberg report that this may have coloured the judgment of executives at a time of high growth for the bank? I can only talk from my own perspective, Deputy, um, that shareholdings never coloured my view in respect to the bank. I, I joined the bank. I had worked in the bank over a period of five years at the time. and was, was long-term in the bank okay. for my future. That's how I saw the future of my Okay, so my the financial career. investment that you also had, you don't feel that it conflicted your ability to have a, a more sound judgment or an objective judgment when it came to things like what shareholders were saying, or stockbrokers, excuse me, were saying about the value of the bank and its condition? Uh, I, I don't believe that at all, that it clouded view. Like, my, my shareholding has cost me very significantly, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I, my shareholding never clouded my view. What was important was to have open dialogue with with investors and with brokers, and I think that the bank engaged in fulsomely. Okay. Um, we heard earlier from another witness that uh, three key events, basically, in the crisis for Anglo. The first was the run on Northern Rock. Um, which also happened the same month as that meeting that you had uh, with potential investors. Would you agree that the Northern Rock run was the first, was the beginning of the crisis for Anglo? Uh, no, Deputy, I would go a little bit earlier. Okay. I would go back to uh, the time when a, uh, a fund from a large French bank uh, was it was noted into the market that they were no longer going to permit cash calls on the fund. And I think that was the start of the liquidity crisis or the first signal that became available in the market. And that was around August. Around August, okay. And then 
subsequent to that, we saw a number of banks, very large global banks, do deals in the market where they took relatively short-term funding at quite high cost. Uh, I think the first public uh, uh, instance uh, you were right to refer to is Northern Rock because you know a, a run on a bank in a, a neighbouring economy was clearly a, a huge issue for the Irish banking system and Europe in general. Okay. Um, if we move forward then towards the end of the year and in December of 07, um, Anglo develops a policy document for stress testing and scenario analysis funding liquidity risk. It's in the evidence book, um, volume 2, page 37, which you would have seen. Um, we're going to go into the book, actually. It's not that important, but it included details for stress parameters for six different scenarios and their impact on the bank's funding and liquidity positions. Was the financial regulator aware that you were doing that work internally at the time? I don't know precisely if the regulator was aware, but this followed the introduction of a new liquidity regime for the Irish banks that was introduced by the regulator. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure if this was communicated by risk to the regulator. Okay. And were you involved in this, in, in, in this document at all and putting it together? In uh, I, 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 may, I might have had limited involvement. I certainly would have seen the document. Okay. I don't think I was involved in putting it together okay. or outlining the stress test. I mean, would, would senior management uh, at the bank at the time have been aware of the domestic standing group? which was the members of the central bank regulator and the Department of Finance, who were working on similar stress test scenarios before the banking system as a whole at the same point in time? I don't know if members of the board were or executive were. I wasn't, Deputy. Okay. Um, and, and so uh, in terms of any relationship between the work the bank was doing internally to, to test its own self and, and how it might um, get through or, or manage a crisis, there was no relationship between that work being done and the work being done by the government, which at the time was modelling in a simulation the possibility of an Irish bank failing, and what impact that might have on the rest of the system. Unless indirectly, Deputy, through interactions with the regulator that this was communicated, uh, I personally just wasn't aware that, okay. of the domestic standing okay. group that you mentioned. So, um, given that these group risks have done this policy report and they're undertaking the stress testing, on a monthly basis, why, in your opinion, um, why did the bank not react sooner then uh, when it came to the, and more robustly, I suppose, to the liquidity problem prior to September 2008? Why, when you're doing this at the end of 2007, and as you say, the crisis has begun since August, why, when it comes to September, do you find yourself um, having miscalculated the risk, actually, and, uh, and the problems that you were going to face? Well, I think from the onset of the crisis, uh, Deputy, in August, September, there was uh, an enormous level of work undertaken in the bank to protect liquidity. Uh, and it's a very difficult balancing act that a bank undertakes, uh, because any sure sign of weakness can cause actually the weakness to, to feed off itself and result in an issue. Um, so the bank worked. Uh, very significantly to manage liquidity in the period. There were a number of issues, I think, that are worth highlighting. Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, the bank was a monoline bank, and businesses um, that are focused niche players tend to do very well in strong economic environments. Businesses that are focused niche players, on the other hand, tend to do less well when economies are hit. Now, I don't think anyone foresaw the scale of crisis that was going to come, but that was a factor that the bank had to handle. Secondly, the bank was single A rated. Mm. And over time, it became uh, de facto necessary to have a double A rating to play in the markets. Uh, thirdly, uh, we had a very particular issue in respect of the CFD holding in the bank. Mm -hmm. And that manifested itself and became known to me towards the end of 2007. But I think the fact that that position was held by so many international counterparties, the market became aware of that. Okay. And that undoubtedly, in my view, had an impact on liquidity in the bank. 
Were you involved with any of the attempts to get the NTMA to place deposits with the bank? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, and did you have a view at the time as to why the NTMA was not placing money with Anglo? I had little or no contact ever with the NTMA until after okay. the until after the crisis. But you weren't involved in discussions with senior management about what was happening with the NTMA or attempts to get um, deposits from them or, or sources of funding? I was aware in the background that there was an effort by the bank to seek funding from all sources. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any direct involvement with the NTMA. Okay. What do you know about the Green Jersey agenda that was undertaken in March of 08 by the financial regulator and the central bank governor? I've heard that term mm -hmm. used. Um, I don't know if I can say anything more than that about it, uh, Deputy. Okay, well, I mean, we've discussed it with, 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 with the Governor, um, and we've discussed it with the other banks as well, but they did approach um, Anglo, and um, the Head of Treasury, John Bow, was tasked with this, this project between the banks. Is that correct? Well, what I recollect, Deputy, is what I recollect, Deputy, is um, contact between the chief executive of the bank, David Drum, and the governor. Mm -hmm. And I recollect David Drum post that meeting giving an instruction uh, to John Bow to come up with a plan on how the banks help each other. Okay. And you were involved with that plan? I wasn't involved in that plan, but I, rec I recollect it being, I recollect something of that nature being highlighted by the Chief Executive in an email post his meeting. Okay. Um, I'll move on from that then. Um, in the same month, um, you were part of a delegation that travelled to the Middle East to look for new sources of funding for the bank. That's correct. Okay. Can you tell new, me a bit new about sources, that? New sources of capital rather than funding. Capital. Can you tell me a bit about that? Um, so in March 2008, uh, Morgan Stanley arranged a meeting with uh, private equity providers or sovereign wealth funds in the region uh, in order to source uh, potential capital for the bank, and in particular it's related to the CFD investment. Okay. And did the regulator know that you were making that? That move in the Middle East? Yes. Okay. And was it successful? Ultimately it wasn't successful. So a number of banks from around the world had approached the region, uh, but the banks that ended up raising capital were very much the global brands or internationally recognised players. Okay. And at what point, or were you involved at all, in any conversations about a guarantee for the bank, either a political one or a legal one? Uh, we had an evidence um, from Kevin Cardiff that Sean Fitzpatrick had raised a form of guarantee with John Hurley at the end of April 2008. I had no involvement, Deputy. You had no involvement? No, I wasn't aware of the guarantee until the morning it was announced. Okay. And um, coming to that, then, political contacts around the time of the guarantee. Uh, did, you, did you make any? Did you have any? I had two okay. in particular. Yeah. Uh, which I think have been aired before the committee. Yeah. Uh, David Drum asked me to make contact with the then leader of the opposition, Enda Kenny. Uh, I contacted Enda Kenny and arranged for him to meet with uh, William McAteer and David Drum. And they, he came to the office to meet with uh, McAteer, Drum and myself, together with Richard Bruton and uh, another person attended with them. Okay. What was the purpose of that meeting? Uh, David Drum gave uh, the attendees a, a pack of information on the background to the bank and, the, and he took them through the, the business model of the bank and what the bank does. Okay. And that was the extent of it? That was the extent of it. And you said there was a second contact? The second contact was Beverly Cooper Flynn, okay. uh, who at the time uh, told me both of these people are from Castle Bar, where I'm from myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and she told me at the time that um, she was involved in a grouping looking at issues around the crisis. And uh, a key message she passed to me was that if the bank was um, uh, going to raise capital in the future, that the only, re the only way that uh, government would look at capital was if the bank could raise private capital as well. 
Okay. Look, I'm curious, these are the only two political contacts that you're aware of the bank making in the crisis period in September, is that correct? They're the only contacts. I think the question you asked me was, yeah. what contacts did I have? Okay, I beg your pardon. But, I mean, was it, were you wondering why you were having political contacts not with the government, but with the opposition, for example? Uh, the, the contact with the opposition uh, pertained to just the general noise uh, in the markets uh, that um, uh, public representatives were making. Okay. And I think in the past, uh, from my knowledge, uh, Anglo had little or no political contact. Okay. And so in the end it found itself in a position where uh, it had to start from scratch to make some engagements, from what I knew. Okay. I, I'm limited for time, so perhaps all my colleagues can continue. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just moving back then, before the crisis period, um, in terms of the interaction with the financial regulator, there was an inspection of commercial property lending activities at Anglo by the regulator in May 2007, which identified 30 separate issues which are required to be addressed. Um, and you would have seen it in the, in the evidence book that's given to you. Uh, were you made aware of that report when it was produced? It's on um, page 67 of volume 1. Thank you, Deputy. Oh, sorry. Um, but thank you. I, have, yeah. I have the document. Thank you, Deputy. I mean, did you see that document when it was produced at the time with a list of 30 separate issues? I, I don't recollect, Deputy. This was addressed to the Chief Executive. Uh, it was CC to the, the Head of Compliance, okay. and it related to, to lending matters. Okay. But we heard earlier in evidence that documents like these were not shown to the Board, documentation from the financial regulator. Would you have been aware of that? When you were in the bank, I had no. I would have no awareness of that. I never sat on the board, um, so I would just have no awareness whether it was or whether it was not shown. Okay. So when you got this document, then in your evidence booklet, the fact that the regulator would have written to the bank in 2007 with 30 different issues related to commercial property lending was absolutely news to you. Surprised by the, the details. Yeah, like, and I've I've read it subsequently, so I can comment in hindsight. But I, yeah. or in, you know, in retrospect, so. You know, I've seen the letter, but you know, it's all relating to lending matters, mm -hmm. some suggestions, some areas of control weakness, some proposed changes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if there was a response, Deputy, to this there was, letter. There, there was a response, and um, I wanted to ask you actually about the response, but you weren't involved in formulating it. I, I, I don't okay. recollect. Um, because just on issue 21, uh, which is there, um, and it was in relation 21.2, which is on page 70. It, it talked about the maximum um, internal property development exposure target being 20% of the loan book. But at March 2007, that exposure accounted for 25% of the loan book. But the response from the bank was that it had no concern with this, um, that the borrowers are proven clients with large scale projects in the UK and Ireland. None of that's familiar to you in terms of being involved. No, in like, I, I assume that response was prepared to that point by risk. Okay. Or lending. Okay. And were you involved then with the financial regulators' five by five big developer exposure inspection of the five banks and the five biggest exposures that happened in December 2007? I don't believe I was. Okay. Okay. Um, you know. But if you weren't involved, then I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, uh, coming back then to September 2008, um, and, and, and just before the guarantee, in fact. Uh, there's a presentation to the board uh, entitled Strategic Options from David Drum. And he notes how the market sees Anglo as a monoline bank with a concentration risk in commercial property. And he's proposing a merger with Irish Life and Permanent um, to create a more diversified business model. And that's in volume one, page 147, that, that um, report that he presented, the presentation that he gave. So were you aware of this at the time? Late to September, you know, Anglo has the difficulties that it has. Are you aware that this is being considered by management and the board? Uh, I was aware, Deputy, okay. that this and a multitude of other options were being considered from more or less the, the early part of 2008 right through to now. Okay. And I think uh, you mentioned uh, ILP. I think, you know, I think that was considered then and certainly at least at one stage earlier. But so, 
when the consideration came, I mean, what did that say to you as a, as a senior person in the bank? Did it tell you? Did it say to you that the business had failed? That the the approach that Anglo had taken um, in the market wasn't successful? That now it found itself in this position? Well, deputy, markets changed dramatically beyond recognition. Um, banks globally and in Europe were under siege. Uh, the Irish banks suffered significantly, and if you are a smaller bank that was further amplified in terms of the pressure you felt in the market. So throughout 2008 there were numerous uh, areas of strategic work to uh, raise capital for the bank, to secure the bank's position, uh, to try and diversify the bank, which was obviously one of the potential benefits from ILP. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some involvement with the bank's advisor, Morgan Stanley, looking at various options. There were options considered with Rabobank becoming an investor. There were options being considered with uh, a larger bank taking over the bank. Uh, so I would say a multitude of options were considered, including doing a rights issue to bolster capital in the bank. But most banks that had tried to do that during 2008, unless they were a global branded player, seemed to damage themselves in the market. So the market read, if you went to raise capital, you had an issue and therefore doubly punished you. So at that point, and just immediately prior to the guarantee, did you believe that the bank was failing? And my second question is, I mean, was the bank beyond saving at that point? I think the bank had a very significant liquidity issue that worsened throughout 2008 and became most acute post the Lehman and Washington Mutual collapse and the various transactions that happened around then and the failure uh, for TARP to be implemented. Um, so the bank had a liquidity issue. Uh, I thought at that time that the issues we had seen and the deterioration in the economy wouldn't be as bad, so I really felt that liquidity, solving liquidity would save the bank at that point in time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.